Good afternoon, everybody. Do you want to um, say hello to the person alongside you for a moment while I get myself organised? And you can stand up if you like and chat away. All right, take a glass of water. Probably disturb the kids, but I will the children. But um, we're going to be turning to Proverbs in chapter four while you're doing that as well. And uh, hello, as we heard earlier on, visitors that might be on their way to uh, Western Australia, and uh, those that have come from the wedding that we had yesterday. Kezia got married to um, Jim James, and um, they had a good wedding. So there's a few that might be visiting as well. Proverbs chapter 4, the topic of the talk today is God's work, my work, okay? Oh, we're going to go to Philippians in chapter 4, chapter 1 first, sorry, Philippians in chapter 1. This just came to my mind. So, work and our God's work. The Philippians in chapter 1, verse 6 being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work, that's the main emphasis of this verse here today, in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Peter, Pastor Peter Visser sings a, a banjo song, Lord, you know, I'm not finished with me yet. If you have any problems with me, just remember, God's not finished with me yet. Um, God hasn't finished with any of us, which we're very grateful about. So we've um, come from different parts of our our lives and what we were doing and we're at different stages of our walk in the Lord and today here you might be the very point of whether I'm going to get baptized today this could be a big thing for you you may have been out of what out in the wilderness for a while and the felt out in the world you've been in the fellowship you've come back welcome uh, you've been sticking around for a number of years and God's just been patiently working with you and you've been faithful as you let him do that. Other times we're a bit stubborn and we give up and we kind of resist the Lord. So for me, when I came to the Lord, this is part of my testimony, um, I came to the Lord and I was unemployable as far as work goes. I hadn't worked for a number of years. I was growing marijuana. Uh, I was living down on McLaren Flat um, and I heard the word came along to the Lord and got baptised and filled the Spirit. The house where I was living in McLaren Flat, all of a sudden the landlord wanted the houses back. There was two houses on a property. Both of them had to be handed in. Uh, Pastor Laurie Nankerville's brother Rick Nankerville was in one of them and there's people that I kind of knew in this fellowship that had relatives here that I didn't know about at the time. So, next thing I'm down in Thebiton. I hated the city, I hated the town. Here I was living right in the industrial part of Adelaide, Thebiton, or the Barton, if you want to call it, <laughs> if you want to be up, up there. Thebiton, Jew Street, near Falding's Chemical Factory. That's where I was, living with a couple of brothers, one of them, David Capel, who recently just passed away, asleep in the Lord. Then it was get a job. We're talking about work. Um, I go to the Vogue. I used to go, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, I'd go to the Adelaide City Council every now and then with a pang of guilt about getting a job. I'd go into the, uh, the depot in Halifax Street, try and get a job and uh, have an argument with the HR lady, walk out. I was always stoned or half tipsy when I get there because I couldn't do it when I was sober or straight. Then I'm at the Vogue one day after about a week in the Lord. Um, my dad was a journalist at the time. He had a lot of contacts in and around Adelaide. He rang up Mr Nicholson, who was the head guy of the Adelaide City Council. Mr Nicholson got me a job. My brother Nick drives down to the Vogue. Dad's got you a job. You've got to ring him up. I rang up Mr Nicholson. I went down the road, down Unley Road, get into a phone booth. And Mr Nicholson says, report tomorrow being the Monday. This is me who has not worked for nearly two years. <laughs> and... I walk out the phone booth, oh, fantastic, God, I've got a job, I've got no money. I look down at my shoe and there's a brand new $20 note. Oh, thank you, Lord, that got me to my first pay. I arrive at the work the next day, go into the depot and there's the lady, my nemesis. She goes, you, I mean, I've got a job over my dead body. <laughs> Mr Nicholson comes out, it's okay, he's all right, he's one of us, and away I went. 
So that became my testimony. I told when I came to the Lord, in the work of the Lord, your job, your testimony at work was vitally important. So that's pretty well the theme of today. Very old sort of fashion talk, but what the heck, we're all in this together and all the people said. <laughs> now we'll go to uh, Psalm, Proverbs chapter 4. So I stayed there for a little while and got a job and it was difficult times, there was challenges, but the Lord got me through it and the main reason that the Lord had me there was to keep my head busy. <laughs> I did not need idle time, idle mind, idle hands is the devil's playground as the saying goes and I needed to work, I needed to earn money, I needed to be able to fall into the community and be, become a testimony and to reach out into people's lives. So that's part of what we do. Yes, the Lord provides Jehovah Jireh. We know that from day dot. But the Lord has got us in our jobs, in our schools, in our sport things that we might be doing to look after you, to find a job, to earn some money, but also to um, save a soul. So on, even on as much as last uh, Friday, yeah, Friday, took the kids to, um, grandkids, to where there's a little forest near our house. They like to build some cubbies and all that, cubby house and fo forest, etc. Go down there and the lady comes along with her two kids and all the kids start talking and then the lady's mum said, oh, hello, how are you going? Her name uh, was Sue. So what do you do for work? She says, um... I, I'm on maternity leave and I'm expecting a baby and, um, but I'm a train driver I said oh do you know Alex Capel being over here <laughs> and uh, she said no my husband works with Alex really well and he's, he's made good contact I'm talking about work and then my mum she's a tram driver and worked with Dion and they, she's Dutch I can't remember her name now and you played eight ball lots of times do you know who I might be talking about so how important is our jobs? Just a little contact like that. I know where she lives, and I'll, we'll, go, we'll make sure we get another visit there. So in Proverbs chapter 4, it says here, verse 23, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Keep our heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And we've got... Um, issues keep the whole world out of the issues of boundaries uh, outgoings uh, going forth everything that we value our source of life comes from within our heart and there's a it's, it's an old fashioned word the keep uh, it's usually associated back in the day with being the central part of a castle where all the the, 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 man, the, the owner the landlord would keep all his documents, water ran through the main part of the keep for water to feed the people in the castle. It was the, the fortress, the centre part of the castle. It was where everything that was of value was kept. The jewellery, the heirlooms, etc. kept in this castle. Has anybody got a castle named after them? Just by interest? Anybody? Oh, the, the French one. Peter Goodrich has got one few others. I've got one in my mother's side, McKinnon. McKinnon Castle in the Isle of Skye, uh, right in the fortress there when you come into the main part of the main part of, of Scotland. And it was a, a place where the uh, control of the trade route would pass and this very decently corrupted McKinnon from way back would make sure that he got his money as the ships would go by. Strategically placed the McKinnon Castle right up there in the Isle of Skye. And you can go around all over the world today and look at the old ruins, the old castles that you have. And in every castle there is a keep, the value of everything that retains that. We're talking about today about God's work, my work. What we hold near and dear here will manifest itself in the boundaries, the things that we allow into our life and the things that we control and the outcomes and everything that we do. And we only have one person always to blame. We have to be truth. It's always us. We have boundaries and we can knock those fences down and let anything through our property, our heart. 
We can let anything. In my day, before I came along to the Lord, I let people with drugs. I got involved in drugs. I helped people get involved in drugs. I know to this day, I think about some uh, indigenous people that I knew down the road. I know personally that I got them involved in drugs. One of those kind of regrets in life. I think, gee, I just I preached to them. But there are things in our walk in the Lord, and it all starts here, our heart. And that's where the Lord said, I've begun a good work in you. And I'm going to perform it unto the day. And it starts with the baptism tank here. Hopefully there'll be people here who want to get baptized, to start afresh, to just begin a new life, get filled with the Holy Ghost and change your life. And if you're unemployable, two things will happen. The Lord will get you a job, but he'll definitely have a job for you as you work in his vineyard. Let's go to 1 Timothy in chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. So there I was, unemployable, but the Lord looked after things. And you become a testimony as you go through your work and people come along. 1 Timothy in chapter 6 verse 1, it says, Let as many servants that as are under the yoke count their own masters. Now we're talking employee employer we can also be talking about within the fellowship count their own masters worthy of all honor that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed and they that have believing masters workers in the fellow employers in the fellowship that you employ people let them not despise them let us who employees not despise them why because they are brethren but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit these things teach and exhort and if any man teach otherwise and consent not to the wholesome words even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is in accordingly to godliness he is proud knowing nothing but doting about questions, strife of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men corrupt of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself. So Paul's writing here to Timothy about the need, if you're a worker, if you're an employer, to your main thrust of bringing people to God is going to be through your workplace. And if you've retired, wherever your social things might be. Our testimony at work and at school is vital. Over in London, there was a girl, Michelle, who decided to go to school and go, I'm going to change my... She hated school. Who can blame her? (laughs) She went to school... And she started to talk to the people about the Lord. And there was a bit of a revival around that school. And a, a lady came on, a 16-year-old girl that had cancer, young 16-year-old, frightened of dying. She got healed. She's still in the fellowship today with her own children. So how important is the work of God when it comes to our work that we do? And if you look down at the very end of the book, the very end of the chapter, it says here, a little note, the first to Timothy written from Laodicea, which is the chief city of Pogla and Pisenia. Okay, I want to look at Revelations in chapter 3 for a moment if we can. Revelations 3. I want to link this part with Laodicea. Importance of work. Laodicea, there's a history of the churches here, the seven churches in the book of Revelation. It coincides with different periods of time that for the last 2,000 years. Laodicea is the last church. Laia, meaning a group of people together. Decea is a, a kind of posse of people fighting against the system demanding justice and decisions that are right for them, a people that bound together. And it's talking about the church of Laodicea run by the people from outside the world and inside the fellowship. Compromise. So this 
church in Timothy writing, he says to be written into the church of Laodicea, at the time there were some serious things going on both economically and also politically around at the time. And so Paul was writing saying you can't fight that system but as individuals you can by the way you conduct yourself in your workplace. Back then he was talking. And Laodicea was a wealthy city in the Roman period Uh, and the book of Revelation was around the same time. There was a Roman emperor named Dominion who um, proclaimed himself to be a god while he was alive. Emperors were always went for deity as eternal after their death. He persecuted Christians at the time and the worship of the emperor and his family was the way in which he survived in the Roman period. You could make a pack, pack of viscos, which is in the Latin is Roman peace accord. So if you were a Jew, you could make a pact with the Roman Empire, the emperor, that you would be left alone if you didn't worship uh, the emperor and his family. In this time, according to history and the Encyclopedia of Britannica, some of the Christians back then in the Laodicea province were trying to make a deal with the Jews because they, if they allowed a bit of the Jewish religion into the Christian faith, sect of Judaism, that the emperor would leave them alone. So it was compromise, and it became, it was read here, chapter 3, unto verse 14, to the church of Laodicea, write these things, saith they, amen, the faith and the truth witness be the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, thou art neither hot nor cold, I would that thou were cold or hot, cold or hot. so then because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing. They were a very powerful place, laid to see. They were a banking sector, and they traded very well. And they wanted to keep trading with the Romans at the time, and they had to compromise in order to, to exist. But it required compromise, and therefore they became lukewarm in their endeavours at the time for their survival. So the work of the Lord was damaged by their way in which the leaders of the time and the people within that church, so to speak, and the period of time that the Laodicea period is talking about, that the Lord was saying, verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. We heard that in the gifts already. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. A church where God is supposed to be in the centre of our heart, of the church, and is centre of the individual, behold, I stand at the door, outside if you like, we've got the triple doors out there, or we've got doors over here, and Jesus Christ is banging on the doors saying, let me in, <laughs> let me in. And the Laodicea people had compromised with the Roman system and allowed a little bit of the Jewish law to come into their church to survive. And they were not relying on the Lord. And the Lord has written to Timothy, but he was talking to the people of Laodicea at the time. So in this one here, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. God's banging on the heart of your heart today. He wants to come in. He wants to fill you with the Holy Ghost and change your life. And trying to uh, stay with the world or try to do both can't work and never will work. The Lord requires you to say, Lord, enough of the world. I want you in my life. And at a time when a self-satisfied church boasting of great wealth not doing too much of themselves lukewarm in the last days a period of time where we live in now where uh, authority is being questioned 
where everything is coming to a lowest common denominator. If you want to get on your mobile phone and be enraged and be spend hours on the mobile phone or your internet, you can and, and, and argue all these causes and defend causes that have nothing to do with your walk, your work in the Lord and the work of the Lord that he's got planned for you. It's the Laodicea time. We live where people are rising up against authority and maybe in some cases rightfully so. But you can hear and feel the swell of people moving, the 8 billion people that we have on the planet that are moving against the systems in our world today. And the Lord is saying to us, well, you can't fight that, but you can maintain your own walk in the Lord by being a testimony with the Lord. And Paul wrote at the time, as labourers working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we suffer it, being defamed, we entreat, we are made the filth of the world and the offscourging of all things unto this day. Paul wrote there back then. And the Lord wants us to be not a self-satisfying individual or self-satisfying worldly popular church that you can get into today's society. Whatever church you want is out there. But we're going to preach baptism, repentance, and being filled with the Holy Ghost. And in my time, get a job, you lazy bludger, and start tithing. Let's go, and we're going to head to Titus. They weren't as refined back then. Get a job, you lazy bludger. <laughs> so, I was talking to Pastor Steve today, Pastor Steve Harvey, just while we go to uh, Titus in chapter 2. I'd heard a testimony that when he came along to the Lord and he had a period of his apprenticeship, it was at Christmas time, he just finished his apprenticeship and um, in the new year, the January, four weeks later, he was begun to become a tradesman. Four week break. In that period, he came to the Lord. It was a time in his life when he was unsettled and he was in disarray within his life. He had no peace and he hated work. Monday, he hated. He'd go to work Monday, stay on the bus, and the bus would go all the way up to Belair. And from Belair, he'd go up to the top and walk around the hills there and hitchhike home. Monday, this is his word, became Tuesday. Brother Ralph Dowdle, we used to, was in the fellowship for a while, he had a bike, and together they'd ride a bike, get stoned, start up in the, in the hills, hitchhike. Tuesdays became Wednesdays, <laughs> not working. Then he came along to the Lord. On the first day he arrived back, his uh, foreman said, what's going on, Harvey? What are you up to? He said, I had a haircut. He said, what a game are you playing, mate? He said, I'm not playing any games. So I need to talk to you. So he sat him down. He said, you know, I'm supposed to sack you. He goes, yep. Then the factory foreman said, Rightio, Harvey, be honest with me. You're not gonna, it's different talking to the foreman. You're talking to me now. What are you up to? And he says, I'm up to nothing. I've received the Holy Ghost and I'm different. He says, you sure you're different? No, no, I'm not sure. I know I'm different. He says, you know I'm supposed to sack you. The tradesmen now, and it was hard to sack apprentices back in the time. Yes, I know that. And he said, what do you think about that? And he said, yeah, sack me now, it's fair enough. I've been, been a terrible worker. And I'll tell you what I'll do for you. I'll give you four weeks. We'll see what happens in four weeks. He stayed in that company for eight years. And he ended up being a supervisor, telling people what to do. How important is our job? Very important. That's where the future revival of our fellowship comes, and at school and where whatever sports hobbies you've got. Whatever interests you have, you've got it there for a reason. Titus in chapter 2, verse 9, exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters, but do as we're told at work, to please them well in all things, 
not answering again. Amplified, not being a blabbermouth and argumentative, trying to have a pick a fight at school with the teachers or at work. Not prolonging. That word means not breaching trust that you have with your work, you with your boss, but showing all good fidelity, fidelity, which means to demonstrate loyalty and support. That they, why do we do that? Here's Paul writing to Titus. Is this just Kernahan raving on? This is written here. Look at the answer. That they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Saviour in all things. It's an amazing way of bringing people to God. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation, he's making a point here, hath appeared to all men, your boss included. So Paul's saying we can't fight the systems of the world, but we can maintain what we do in our walk in the Lord. Let's go to Colossians in chapter 3. And Colossians was neighbours with Laodicea. So Paul's written to Timothy, to Titus, to Colossians. Back in the day, chapter 3, verse 22. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleases, but in singleness of heart. We talked about it at the beginning in Proverbs 4, verse 23. Keep my heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues, the boundaries, the conduct, the manner in which we behave in fearing of God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily, as Pastor Steve said, I'll just quote him, I found peace. I found peace with working. And I actually started to enjoy work. And I found happiness at work. And that people could not believe how much I changed. So I said, what's the lesson, Pastor Steve? He said, find peace at work because you'll preach the gospel. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respecter of persons. Masters, bosses, give your, unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that you have a master in heaven. In other words, if you're a boss, you treat your employees well, because God, your master, is treating you well as an employer unto him. And we don't know why the Lord puts us in places where we work. There, there, there may be greater reasons. I mean, as an example, I haven't worked with Dion's fellow worker but I don't know what's in her life and maybe the Lord's and in the, the lady who's the daughter who's pregnant she's got two kids don't know what's in her life but all of a sudden there's, there's a door open wide open I just want to give a, a principal example as to how the flow of what we can do can impact in, in people's lives just want to go to Genesis in chapter 21 just as a there's a story but there's a principle behind the story that I would like to maybe emphasize so Abraham and Sarah um, have a child up but before that Abraham has a child through Hagar who's a bondwoman and the two are not getting on and there's a whole story behind that and the point I want to make in this particular verses here is that the Lord has us for a reason to go into these places and she says in verse 10, cast this bondwoman out and her son, for they are not heirs accordingly. And they weren't getting on. Verse 11, and the thing was very grievous to Abraham's sight because of his son. He was 13 at the time. And God said unto Abraham, let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad, because of thy bondwoman. And all that Sarah had said, hearken unto her the voice of Isaac, for Isaac shall be shall thy seed be called. The seed of promise and the bond one, the just the two families. Verse 14, we'll go to, Abraham rose up early in the morning, took bread and a bottle of water, gave it to Hagar, putting it in on her shoulder. And the child sent her away, and she departed and wandered into the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water was spent in the bottle, and she cast the child under one of the shrubs. And she went and sat her down over against him a good way off, as it were a bow shot. For she said, Let me not see the death of a child. And she sat over against him and lifted 
up her voice and wept as you would. And God heard the voice of her, of the lad. That little boy that was under that bush was calling out to God. She was involved from an adult, Sarah telling, get rid of the bondwoman, etc. And just read it here. And God heard the voice of the lad and the angel of God called out to Hagar from heaven and said unto her, what aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Sometimes you're at work and the people that you are needing to be in contact with are like someone else is crying out to God. And you might be working with a, a, a lady or a bloke, whatever, but in their lives and in their family is a person calling out to God. And God is using your work, your situation at school, your social thing, whatever you're doing, as a vehicle to access that individual. So that's how we operate as a church. We're talking about God's work, my work. And when I, I read this verse a few, several months ago, I thought, oh, I've never really seen that before about what it says about the lad. I thought, oh, dog, wow, the lad. And I was over in Europe. And there was a little lad, 11-year-old boy, he's dying of leukemia. He's spirit-filled. His mum and dad don't come along. And there are saints, and Pastor Peter, etc., praying for this young boy. And I thought, ah, oh, that's why I read that story. This little boy, his parents are not coming along. He's a spirit-filled little boy, and he wants to be healed. He wants to get better. So we don't know, and it just became apparent that the Lord heard the prayers of this boy. And God hears the prayers of people. And when we're working, it may be someone else. So Paul writes in Colossians, in Timothy, in Titus, the importance of our testimony. Let's go back to Colossians, shall we? The story is the principle of we don't know what the Lord's got planned, but we do know, Lord, here I am, send me. Colossians in chapter 4. That boy in our, is in our prayers even to this day. Colossians chapter 4, verse 13. For I bear him record, this is the Lord, oh, sorry, Epaphras is in verse 12, he's doing great things there at the time. For I bear him record, there's a great zeal for you and them that are allowed to see you. And in them in Heropolis, Heropolis, whatever. Luke, the beloved physician, Demas greets you. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphus. And the church was in his house. And when this epistle is read among you, cause it to be read also in the churches of the Laodiceans. And that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. So Laodicea was under the pump, if you like. And they were falling. And Paul writes to the Colossians, which were neighbours with Laodicea. This is an emphasis that Paul's making here about how we can live our lives today. As a saying, we can't fight a self-satisfying people. We can't fight the systems of the world that are banging on the doors of every political party in the world. We can't bang on the doors of every social issue that's, that's being involved in today. But what we can do is our bit as far as where the Lord's got us, and that's at our workplace or our school, whatever it might be. Let's go to the Ephesians, shall we? Ephesians in chapter um, 6. Is this an outdated talk? <laughs> is it outdated? Has it no relevance? For today, if Paul's writing here, then it's very relevant to today. And it's where the power of the Holy Ghost lies when we're talking to people. It's where we see signs, wonders and miracles being performed as we go. To the church at Ephesus that Paul had laid hands on with the twelve and they received the Holy Ghost, helped set up the church in verse 5 of chapter 6. Servants, 
Be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of heart, as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleases, but as the servant of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that whatsoever good thing that any man doth, the same shall receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free, and ye masters or ye owners or bosses, do the same thing unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that, of, that your master also is in heaven, and neither is he a respective persons with him. So we've got the church at Ephesus, we've got the church of Colossia, we've got Laodicea, we've got Titus, We've got Timothy all expounding Paul the Apostle himself saying these things are vital for the growth of the church. It's what we would do. And he makes the point where the power of the Holy Ghost lies in, in our lives and the lives of people. It's not about the work. It's about the testimony that you have that draws people to you. And, you know, we, you, can, you have your own stories and testimonies you have at work of how we conduct ourselves, and whether you've come to the Lord and then you've got to work on the Monday of a changed person or whether you've got to school the next week or whether you've got a new job and you're going in there for the first time and you don't know how you're going to go, eventually they're going to find out that you're a Christian and then comes the challenge of what we will do, how, what we will say. And if we believe that the Lord has put us there, then we're going to be an amazing testimony. If it's just for making money... I don't know if it will bring you satisfaction and happiness. But if you know that the Lord's got you there for a reason, then you can always be saying, Lord, what's the reason? Let's go to Acts 18. Just one other thing about Paul. Acts 18. Did you see what Paul did in his own life? Moved around a fair bit, Paul. It says in verse 1, After these things Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because of that Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them, and because he was of the same craft, for he abode with them and wrought, for they were both, but for their occupation, they were tent makers. So Paul the Great made sure that he worked to provide his way through all the epistles that we read. He somehow found a way to preach the gospel. And then Aquila, it says in verse 25, there's Apollos, this man was instructed, verse 25, fervent in spirit, taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila, two workers, and Priscilla heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. So that's how we've had our revival over the years, people who we work with and people that put in our place. Today, it might be a work colleague, it might be a student, university, whatever it is. Today, I want to make it real clear how you can get right with the Lord. We're going to go to Acts chapter 2. Paul the Great worked his way through his life and he was a testimony at his workplace, wherever he was. And Peter worked hard for the Lord and carried his business well for the Lord. And you and I here today um, is so vital to our survival as people in the Lord that we maintain our testimony at school and at work. And tomorrow, the challenge will be, with this talk, the challenge will be that the Lord will put a conversation in front of you tomorrow where you will be able to talk about the things of the Lord. The difficulty lies is you don't know what reaction you're going to get. But as I said a few weeks ago, I've been on jobs where they've spat in my Bible, they've threatened me, they've ridiculed, the cancer this was many years ago, they've um, challenged every part of my life, called me gay, 
because I was a single bloke. Oh, every name under the sun on that one at the time. But each and every one of those men, hardened men, in their hour of need, because there was a guy who was spirit-filled that I worked with in the same gang. He drank, he smoked, he compromised. They loved him. His name was Vic. He was in with them. I was always ostracised. But the moment those people had a need, what do they get drawn to? Strength, power, Holy Ghost, not us. And that's what the Lord will do. Forbearing, he said to us. Just forbear it. Forbear the threatenings. Because in the hour of need, that person might have a relative that is calling out to the God like that lad. I've heard to the mum, Hagar, I've heard the lad. He'll put away a bow's throw, maybe from there to there. There's the lad under the bush. There's mum. God talking to Hagar. I've heard that boy cry. That's what God will do. Someone out there whom you work with all at school may have a relative to this hour that is calling out to the Lord for help. And we are the people. And all the people said, and today, if you've come for that reason, Peter said in chapter 2, verse 38, repent, which obviously you are here, to, you've repented, be baptised, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Come along and get baptised. The call is there. I'm going to hand over to Ramundo. Is that right? Or Chaz? Someone? He's going to be singing um, on his own Amazing.